My name is Chris Cook. I'm the Managing Director of the Office of Communication and Marketing at Texas Tech University and Texas Tech Public Media. Texas Tech University is full of great communicators and together we hope to bring you perspectives and insight that can help you in your field. Communication is what we do every day and it's intricately connected to our success and failures. This is Communicators in a Cart. When Nicole Cherry picked up the violin at a young age, she embarked on a musical journey that has taken her to some of the world's premier venues, allowed her to perform with world-class conductors and accompany superstar artists. She's used her talents to entertain audiences, mentor students, and inspire people. Now as a doctoral student in the School of Music, Nicole continues to share her gift with the Texas Tech and Lubbock communities. Sorry to interrupt. This oh, sounds beautiful. No, thank you so much. I appreciate that. What are you working on? Um, right now I'm working on a piece that a friend of mine from school wrote me. Uh, and uh, it's exciting. As you can see, it has a lot to going on <laughs> here. <laughs> so these uh, really funny uh, contemporary composers. But this is by uh, David Wallace. And okay. he wrote it for me uh, based on the research I'm doing here at Texas Tech. Do you have time to go talk about that research hey, and some why of your not? other work? Yeah, right, sure. Let's go do it. Okay. Right, thanks. Okay, can I bring my phone? Absolutely. <laughs> you can't, can't leave without the phone. Without them, no, right? you can't. So where are you from originally? I know you spent a lot of time, it looks like, in the D.C. area, but where are you from? Yeah, that's exactly okay. where I'm from. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland, to be literal. Yep. But it was 20 minutes away from D.C. on a train, and uh, I spent a lot of time there. I was kind of a nerdy, geeky kid, so <laughs> I would, after school, just go straight down to um, southwest D.C., spend some time in the National Gallery, the Smithsonian, uh, Kennedy Center. I, if I could just build a cot at the Kennedy Center as a kid, I yeah. would have, you know, I just, that was my place. I so loved it. when did your interest in music begin? Uh, just really early, Chris, because my dad uh, played piano and uh, he made, he minored in piano in college. So every night he'd play piano <laughs> uh, after dinner and I'd sit at his feet while he played Chopin or Duke Ellington or right. any number of different things. So Good mix of yeah, classical yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. He exposed us to lots of different music. And my mom equally was supportive. She, she wasn't much of a musician, <laughs> but she was a, definitely a great audience member. So uh, me and my brother, who's older, also is a musician. And uh, he's a bass player, jazz bass player. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we were always playing in church and school and I sang in the choir, played piano. I started on piano, but then moved to violin much later. Well, you've obviously picked it up well. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm working at it. So, on, on pra how many hours a day would you say, as you were starting out, did you practice? From the get-go, I can't even say it was hours because I was kind of young, but uh -huh. I practiced a lot because I was very passionate about it. Um, the music itself, so I guess I would say eh, 30, 45 minutes a day okay. at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't like in a row, that was like different, I would pick okay. it up 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15, I gotta go practice. And uh, it was kind of like a thing, speaking of a golf cart, like uh, Tiger Woods' mother would say, you can't golf till you do your homework. Right. And my mom would always kind of say that to me, you, you know, finish your homework, then you can go practice. You have some really, a lot of interesting experiences mm -hmm. um, throughout the, the, your career playing mm -hmm. or in, in education. But um, what brought you to Texas Tech? We're gonna go backwards, but we're <laughs> oh gonna start my. here. What brought you to Texas Tech? Yeah, well I got here as soon as I could. That's, and that's a great answer. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> it is kind of a convoluted story, but I was in Texas for a little bit already. I was, um, I'm sorry, Red Raiders, but I was at Texas A&M. I wrote that I down. I said it out loud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and I, w I am actually in a quartet, Marian Anderson quartet, mm -hmm. that I uh, was in residence at Texas A&M for a good decade. And we you know, did a lot of things with the schools and started a camp there. And one of my members had a kind of personal affair that she had to take care of. 
So we took a hiatus, mm -hmm. and my whole entire life I had wanted to get my doctorate. And education is just so important to me, right. and, and also evolving as a person is so important to me. And so I said, I'm not going to leave this earth without this doctorate. I just, I just something that I needed to do. So I took that this time, this moment, I, you know, hope, uh, hoping for my colleague, but also took this time for myself to get the doctorate. And so I applied, to, as you know, there's a lot of great music schools in Texas, right? you know, but I sent a lot of emails and Annie Chalix Boyle emailed me like almost 10 minutes later. Mm -hmm. And she said, come, you know, and she just was not hesitant. We set up a time. It was probably November or something, uh -huh. some weird time of year. And I was thinking I would come the next year. She said, why don't you come now? Yeah. Why don't you come audition and come for this next semester? And she was just so proactive, so, she didn't know my situation right. per se, but she was just so engaging and so embracing of what I wanted. <laughs> and so I went and after the audition, she gave me a lesson, and, you know, which she didn't have to do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, forget it. I'm not even gonna audition at the rest of the places. Right, so when I walked in earlier, you played a beautiful piece oh, and you talked you. a little bit about it, but, uh, explain your project a little more in depth and, mm -hmm. and, and tell me who George um, Bridgetower is. Well, George Bridgetower came into my life actually very uh, about 10 years ago watching the movie Immortal B Beloved, which mm -hmm. is about Beethoven. But most recently, um, starting this uh, degree at Texas Tech, the doctoral degree, my teacher, Annie Chalix Boyle, she assigned me the Kreutzer Sonata, this very same piece that was in this movie. And apparently, again, arguably, it's one of the hardest violin sonatas ever written mm -hmm. and one of the most revolutionary pieces that Beethoven wrote besides, you know, the Eroka Symphony or the Beethoven's Fifth right. Symphony. And um, so in my research of figuring out what this piece was all about, I learned that it wasn't actually written for Rudolf Kreutzer, which it's Dick's name, nicknamed who was a very famous French uh, violinist at the time. It was written for Afro-European violinist, George Bridgetower. And I was like, oh, this is very interesting. And I knew that, but I didn't connect it till that moment. So it's really all her fault that I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> this research right now. I was looking back at, at some of your experiences. You've played all over the world. Um, very impressive, just Europe, Africa, mm -hmm. Middle East, Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, in, in something I read in South Africa, you went to mm. maybe under, underdeveloped areas, mm. and this was during apartheid, mm. and you yeah. played. So what, what of that experience, why did you feel it important to, because we're, we're talking about also places like Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. and some of the premier and, and well-known um, uh, places to perform, yeah. and then you're going into these yeah. underdeveloped areas and sharing your music right. um, with with uh, uh, people there. Yeah. Why was that important to you? Oh my goodness. Uh, and what did you get out of it? What a fantastic question. No one's ever asked me that. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, um, and it's it's interesting you say that because it's true as a, you know, um, evolving or growing violinist or musician, you say, oh, I'm gonna go to Carnegie Hall. and. We all do, we all wanna play there and everything, but I feel like for me, I've always felt very, very um, at home, serving <laughs> through my music in some way. Not to say that playing at Carnegie Hall is not service, because people go and they wanna be entertained, but um, whenever I'm reaching back or reaching out to people who just wouldn't have certain opportunities or need an uplift, <clears throat> that is the most gratifying for me. Um, it's interesting, you know, we talked about growing up in D.C. I grew up around a lot of embassies. And as a young child, I always just said, I'm going to be an ambassador, mommy, or whatever. And I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Little did I know, it I might end good. up in Peru yeah. somewhere if I did it for real or whatever. But, um, but I think through music, I feel very strongly that I want and am committed to being an ambassador. And so that opportunity to go to uh, South Africa was, even at a younger age, mm -hmm. was very um, uh, distressing for me. Sure. Especially during that time, my dad was a sociologist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he would always talk, you know, you have to weigh the pros and cons and you know what's going on. He would yeah. always explain, 
And so uh, I went there kind of with a chip on my shoulder, like why, you know, why would you do this to a group of people? Right. You know, why is this happening? I met a young man named Eli, I'll never forget it. And we played uh, a little bit of music. They sang for us, this choir, and then his name was Eli. And he came up to me after and he said, you are Ella Fitzgerald. And I said, thank you. <laughs> Not quite, but <laughs> thank you. But to him, like I represent, and he wanted right. to be a musician in yeah. his life, you know, and here he is, you know, there's no, he's just trying to find food for the next That's day. That's a heck of really. a pedestal to be right. put on. Right? <laughs> I know, it's like, great. oh my goodness, yeah. okay. <laughs> but, um, he, you know, to him, I kind of symbolized this, yeah. this possibility to get right. beyond where he was. And I'll never forget that. And uh, we exchanged addresses and he, would write me every time, and he would always, dear Ella, you know, like, it was like <laughs> I have those letters somewhere, I don't know. But um, moments like that, yeah. you know, and again, I was just a young uh, sure. person, but I feel like um, those are the moments that, you know, uh, help you, mold you, you know. Just your, your, your background of even where you play, as we've mm -hmm. been talking about, mm -hmm. but, but I, think, I think in your bio, it said Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, mm -hmm. these great places soup kitchens and correctional facilities. That's right, that's right. So it's all part of that it is. education and, it and is. outreach. Yeah, uh, all the greatest stories come from those soup kitchens too. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, they're, and they're probably very appreciative of the uh, Oh, they're performance. greatly appreciative. Actually, one time my quartet played a, at a maximum, um, how do you say, maximum? Maximum security? Pr prison, prison yeah. exactly. And we went in and we're all we're getting you know, checked and the whole thing was crazy. And then we go in and we're just gonna play some Dvorak and Mozart for the, you know, that was the whole thing too, mm -hmm. is that you don't fixate the music for the situation per se, where, you know, all, the music is for everybody and it's all, you know what I mean? It's all equal. So we're playing the same programs we play at Carnegie Hall. Carnegie Hall, soup kitchen, same program, right. you know. Um, but the, the atmosphere is so different, right? <laughs> I'm sure. Well, at a, well, it's a little different at a maximum <laughs> security prison in Carnegie Hall, just so you know. But anyway, um, while we're playing, it's like we're playing this climax, and they're like, whoa, yes! You know, and they're yelling, and they're like, thank you, and saying all these things. And then we finish, and they're standing up and cheering like it was the Super Bowl. Right. And I'm like, I want to come here every week. <laughs> this is an audience right here. <laughs> right. You know, it's the greatest. Well, that's, that's the awesome. greatest. Yeah. And um, same thing with juvenile detention. Mm -hmm. Right after, they stand up and they say, thank you so much for your, this wonderful performance. It was so meaningful me, uh, meaningful to me for this, 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 or whatever. And it just, I mean, it moves you so much. It's beautiful. So, last thing. Yeah. I, and and I'm, I might get these series wrong, but I know I'm gonna get the last one right. Mm -hmm. So, you, you not only play, yes. but you also sing. Mm -hmm. You okay. beatbox. <laughs> I read that. Oh, I read yeah, that in your yeah, bio. Yeah. You beatbox. Right, right, right. So I, I should I, erase that. <laughs> 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 so we're not going to get a sample of that? Where's that website again? Do, okay. do, do we get a sample of that? or? Oh, beatboxing? Yeah. Okay, sure. I don't. I can't rap or anything. That's okay. okay I just want to, yeah. Just for the he uh, heck of it, sorry. That's okay. Uh, That's awesome. Okay. Here, the things just... you do for TV. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I read that was that I read that today. I said, "Oh, I'm asking her that. We, we we've got to see if she'll do it." Usually, so, though, somebody's rapping. So, ready? One. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> now, see, I almost got caught because, oddly enough, yeah. I know all the words to yeah. Cool Mo D's. I go to work. Oh. And so I was on a, I was being interviewed and they said, somebody said, Hey, we saw this. Yeah. You're going to give it to us. Yeah. And I was like, no, yeah. I'm not. Cause it's awful. It's awful. I, I'm it. no, no, no. Okay. I can sit here and okay. I can, okay. I see, I called you out on it and you did it, but I can't, be, <laughs> Chris. I can't, the lasting impression here can't yeah. be me okay. do a cool mod. So there, <laughs> but I just love that you know the words of that. That is awesome right there. You know. But, um, but uh, Nicole, thank you so much. You're oh, yeah. I mean, there's so much more about I, you that, I, that I, um, I'd love to cover, but we might do a part two one day. That would be so great. Be I'm enjoying myself. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much Chris. I appreciate nice it. Thank you talking to you.